started. So John 18, Exodus 3, Psalm 138, Colossians chapter 1. And let's pray. Our God and our Father, Lord, again, I do thank you for this day. And I thank you, Lord, that we are gathered together to worship you, O oh Lord. And I thank you, God, because that is that's so important for the disciple of Jesus Christ. Because we are like sheep, and sheep need to flock together. Those sheep that go off by themselves often, often go astray. And Lord, I thank you that we are gathered together today to worship you and now to open your word, which is really another worship of you. And I thank you, God, that you have given us your word, that we can read it and reread it and continue to read it to the end of days. Lord, I thank you because your word is true. We know it's true from in to amen. And I thank you, God, that we can trust it and know that it builds our faith in you. It helps us to know you better and to conform us unto the, your son, Jesus Christ, and away from the world. And God, I pray that this time would bless you that Jesus Christ would be magnified. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, that he would work on our hearts and minds today and every day, guiding, directing, convicting, chastising, whatever it is that we need. And I thank you, Lord, that you love us, and you loved us long before we ever loved you. And this I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. All right, so John chapter 18, we're going to start at verse 1. John chapter 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Sidron, where was a garden, into the which he entered and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place. For Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way that the saying might be fulfilled which he spake. Of them which thou gavest me have I lost none. So as we had looked at the arrest of Jesus Christ last week, I had left out talking about John's Gospel because I wanted to spend some time with this passage and we would have been here another hour if, if I had done that. And, and so... With John's gospel account, what you find is with John's gospel, he fills in some blanks that Matthew, Mark, Luke didn't put in the, into there. And again, each of the gospels were written under Holy Spirit inspiration. They wrote exactly what God wanted them to write. John's gospel comes well, several years after the other gospels were written. And, and like I said, he fills in some spots that the others didn't have. And so after he prayed what is read in John chapter 17, Jesus Christ was approached by Judas Iscariot with a band of men and officers. 
we have to remember that it was dark outside. So they had lanterns and torches, and they brought weapons just in case. Which is interesting because really when you think about it, during the entire time of Jesus Christ's three-year ministry, the only, there was only one time that a weapon was shown, and that was when Jesus Christ used a scourge to, and a whip to drive the money changers out of the temple twice. Otherwise, there was no acts of violence, and if anything, the only violence that ever happened was of the people threatening to stone Jesus Christ and more than once wanting to take him and once throw him off a cliff. But otherwise, Jesus Christ never showed any violence and yet they still brought weapons to arrest him with. Now, as a reminder, the four Gospels, they present Jesus Christ in four different fashions. Matthew's Gospel shows Jesus Christ as king. And that's why there's the lineage given at the beginning, and that lineage points to Jesus Christ having a rightful claim to David's throne. Mark's gospel shows Jesus Christ as a servant, and much time is spent showing Jesus Christ in action and in service toward others. The gospel according to Luke points toward Jesus Christ being the Son of Man, and we discussed that some last week. And again, you'll find another lineage in, in Luke's gospel that points to Jesus Christ, again, as the rightful heir to the throne of David. And when you read John's gospel, you will see Jesus Christ as God. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that phrase, I am, is said by Jesus Christ many times in the gospel according to John. And especially in this passage in John chapter 18, that phrase, I am, has a greater meaning. Keep your finger here in John, but go over now to Exodus chapter 3. Keep your finger in John, go over to Exodus chapter 3. Now in the book of Exodus, after the Israelites had been in, yeah, Exodus chapter 3, had been in Egypt for a long time, and they cried out to the Lord God because of their slavery to the Egyptians. The Lord called Moses to be used by God to lead them out of Egypt and to the land promised to them through Abraham. The Lord calls to Moses from the burning bush, and he tells Moses what Moses is to do. Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I am come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. <coughs> now Moses thought he might have to explain to the Israelites who had sent him. And so he asked the Lord for the name to give to them. This is the first time that this name appears in, in the Bible. But the, that name, I am that I am, it shows the Lord's eternal and everlasting existence. The Lord God of heaven has always existed. He was here before time began, and he is the one that began time. Because that'll be something that some atheists will come up to you and they'll say, you know, well, what was here before God? There wasn't anything here before God. God is all existent. He is never, there has never not been God. You know, but they just, they try to come up with whatever they can to, 
try and disprove God. They'll never be able to do that. That word, I am that I am, shows that God is unchanging. And the Lord is informing Moses that I am what I am at present, but I am what I am, have been, and I am what I shall be, and shall be what I am. The Lord is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. The Lord is the everlasting God. There are no gods before him or after him. Now in 1 Corinthians, Paul had written in 1 Corinthians 15, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And that truly is the best that man can aspire to be on his own. But the Lord God of heaven has declared himself to be, I am that I am. The Lord needs no one else. The Lord does not define himself by others, nor does he need to define himself by others. And that's why Paul had written, but by the grace of God I am but I am what I am. Because what I am is only because of God, not anything else. Now, for example, I could define myself as Scott, Son of Edward, husband of Linda, father of three children, pastor of this congregation, employee of a large corporation. But best of all, I can define myself as being a child of God, Amen. a disciple of Jesus Christ, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Every way that I define myself relies on someone else to help define me. I am that I am fully describes God and does not need anyone or anything else to define him. The Lord is the ever-existing God. <laughs> what a wonderful God that we have. We don't have to, you know, there, there's those uh, sayings that get floated around on the internet, and they'll show up in emails. I haven't seen it in a long time, but you know they'll go like, "God is like Dove soap," you know, because Dove soap is what like ninety nine and nine tenths percent pure or something. Well, God is not like Dove soap. He's better than that. He is one hundred percent pure. You know, and God is like Coke. He's the real thing. No, he's nothing like Coke. You know, and, and, but I get it. People send those types of things out. They, they, they probably mean well, but they don't understand the, the, the depth of God. And they don't understand the true holiness of God. I don't even fully understand it. You know, it, it's something that we grow in that understanding of it and thereby growing in that we are growing in sanctification and holiness ourselves through that. But I am that I am is more than enough to describe God, and it bases on God. He doesn't try to describe himself by any other means. Psalm 8 verse 1 says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Isaiah 52, 6, Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that doth speak. Behold, it is I. There is an importance to the name of Jesus Christ and the name of God. And it is far beyond what we think of. There's more to that. Joel chapter 2 tells us, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Now, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We're done here in Exodus. Go over to Psalm 138 now. Psalm 138. 
And so the name of the Lord is important. It's important for people to know who God is. It's important for people to know who Jesus Christ is. And God is more than just really the nebulous God that people talk about today. You know, well, I pray to God. Okay, but what God? And you notice people are more than willing to talk about God, but they're not willing to talk about Jesus Christ. Because that name offends them. Because that name is exclusive. It's not inclusive as we think of inclusive today. It's inclusive in the fact that <coughs> whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it's inclusive that way. But if you don't call upon the name of the Lord, that's where it's exclusive. There's no other way around that. There are not many ways to heaven, as Oprah would have you believe. There's one, and that's Jesus Christ. So people must call upon the name of the Lord in order to be saved. And God has elevated his word above all his name. Psalm 138, go to verse 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. It is the word of God that tells us of his name. To know more of the Lord God of heaven means that you must be reading his word and holding his word in high regard. Remember in John chapter 1, verse 1, it said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is Jesus Christ. Now, if you were to listen to a Jehovah's Witness, I wouldn't recommend it, but if you were to listen to a Jehovah's Witness, they change John chapter 1, verse 1, so that it doesn't say the Word was God. They'll say, was, was a God. Big difference. Jesus Christ is God. There's no other way around that. But the Jehovah's Witness need Jesus Christ to be something else for their religion to work. But it falls apart when you start then comparing the rest of Scripture with Scripture. Sadly, they're, they're, they're lost. They're lost. The word is Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 5 tells us, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. The Lord God has magnified Jesus Christ as the living Word of God. And the entire Bible is about Jesus Christ. From end to amen, Jesus Christ is seen in each book of the Bible. Jesus Christ is preeminent over everything and everyone. And what that means is that he is above all people, he is above all things, he is over all things. Why? Because Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord of all. We're done in, uh, in <laughs> Psalms. Go over to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Jesus Christ is Lord over all. Colossians chapter 1. Now I admire Paul because he can write very long sentences. And I admire that because I've tried. And We're going to start down in verse 13. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. And Paul is referring to God here as we pick up in John in Colossians 1, 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. 
and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Jesus Christ is preeminent. It means he is over everything. And Jesus Christ has always existed. He is not a created being. He is not something that God made or that God had a child by some unknown woman. Jesus Christ has always existed. Jesus Christ is God. And the Lord has magnified his word. Jesus Christ above his name. And it is the name of Jesus Christ that draws people to the Lord. And it is the name of Jesus Christ that sadly offends those that refuse to know the truth. Which is also Jesus Christ. But when you look at what that's saying in, in verse 17 of Colossians chapter 1. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. Jesus Christ by being before that means he is ahead of all things. He is before all everything that existed, and everything consists because of him. You think for a moment, when he died on the cross, when he gave his life on the cross, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What happened? The earth began to quake. And almost as if for a moment, he let go, just for a moment, so that not all things by him consisted. But he had control. He always had control. Nothing happens without his knowledge that it's going to happen. And you look at verse 16. For by him were all things were created that are in heaven, that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. You know, and so, like in the bulletins, we always put in every week the creation moments and learn all the different things that, that God has done in his creation and the, the amazing things that God has done. And the one that always sticks out to me the most is the one that talks about you know, why birds' feet don't freeze in the wintertime. And, and it's because God set up their circulatory systems so that the feet can't freeze in the winter time, and yet our feet can get cold in the winter time. You know, God is consistent in all things, and He does this for us all. And He created all things, and it says there about visible and invisible. The people that are in power in the governments across this world are there because God allowed it to happen. For whatever reason, He allowed it to happen. And whoever gets put into power come November and then come two years from now, it's because God is in control of it all. God knows what is going to happen. He is the one that takes care of these things. And it is Jesus Christ that created everything. From the smallest little bug to the biggest whale, God created everything. Jesus Christ created everything. And it is his name that affects people. It is his name that offends, but it also comforts. And there's a hymn, we haven't sung this one yet. It's by Charles Wesley. I like this hymn. It goes, Jesus, the name high over all, in hell or earth or sky, angels and men before it fall, and devils fear and fly. Jesus, the name to sinners dear, the name to sinners given. It scatters all their guilty fear. It turns their hell to heaven. Jesus, the prisoner's fetters, breaks and bruises Satan's head. Power into strengthless, strengthless souls it speaks and life into the dead. Oh, that mankind might taste and see the riches of his grace. The arms of love that compass me would all the world embrace. Oh, that my Jesus, heavenly charms, might every bosom move. Fly, sinners, fly into those arms 
of everlasting love. Happy if with my latest breath I may but grasp, I'm, I'm sorry, I may but gasp his name. Preach him to all and cry in death, Behold, behold the Lamb. He is the name that we're to be telling people about. It is Jesus Christ that we should be talking about. Go back over now to John chapter 18. We're done in Colossians. John 18. John 18, look at verse 4. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should be... That, hmm, start it again. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. Now please note, in, your, in the King James Bible, that word he is in italics. Now I realize like if some of you are using a phone, they probably don't have the italics in it, but the word he is in italics. And when you see words italicized in the King James Bible, that means that the word was not there specifically in the Greek text, but that the translators put in the word he to increase the readability of it. it so it, it would help make sense of that passage. So he is not there to add emphasis or anything like that. It's there so it makes sense when reading it. So the band of men told him that they were looking for Jesus of Nazareth, and he replied, I am. That's what he said. I am. As soon as he had said unto them, verse 6, as soon as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. In this dark hour, in the garden of Gethsemane, lit only by torches and lanterns, Jesus Christ reveals himself to be the light of the world. Jesus Christ shows himself to be God. Note that Jesus Christ stands up to the band of men and he is in charge of the situation. As we just read in verse 4, Jesus therefore knowing all things that should come, should come upon him. He knew that this was his hour. He knew the men were coming to arrest him and that they were led by Judas Iscariot. The apostle that had stood with Jesus Christ for three years of ministry was now standing with the men that would arrest him and bring him to trial. The men called Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. They did not know him. They did not know that they were arresting God manifest in the flesh. They did not know that one day in the future, they will be kneeling before the Lord Jesus Christ, whom they arrested. They did not know that one day they will be kneeling and acknowledging him to be Lord of all. Now Jesus Christ spoke, I am. And the men went backward and fell to the ground. Psalm, one, I'm sorry, Psalm 27, verse 1 and 2 reads, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Jesus Christ was fulfilling prophecy here. Psalm 35, verse 4 reads, Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that, defi that devise my hurt. Psalm 40, verse 14, Let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. Now how often... Do men come up to arrest and find that the person they were seeking to arrest would just say two words, 
and they would fall over backwards and onto the ground. These men seeking to arrest Jesus Christ were only looking for Jesus of Nazareth, but they found out they are arresting the Lord of Lords. And consider Judas Iscariot here. This man was with Jesus Christ for three years. He heard Jesus Christ speak many, many times. He, heard, he saw the miracles that Jesus Christ did. Nothing was withheld from Judas Iscariot to see or hear, and yet Judas Iscariot never believed on Jesus Christ. There are those in the world today that will declare that they will believe on Jesus Christ if he would do something wondrous at their beck and call. And there are those that proclaim a belief in Jesus Christ because they have seen great signs and heard of wonders. When you think about it, Judas Iscariot had advantages over all the people of the world, past, present, and future, except for the ele other 11 apostles. And yet he never came to a saving knowledge of Jesus, Jesus Christ. How sad that is. And even the men that sat before Jesus Christ as he is on the cross, and they call up to him and they're mocking him, come down from that cross. And even if he had come down from that cross, they still wouldn't have believed. Their hearts were too hard. And how sad, G Judas Iscariot had advantages that so few ever had, and he still did not believe. Judas Iscariot remained in his sins as a son of perdition and is now spending all of eternity in hell. And there are people today, there are people today that are in church services every time they are occurring that may daily read their Bible, that do great works, but they do not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And there are people today that never read their Bible, rarely pray except in the time of calamity, and only want God around as a divine butler, and they do not know Jesus Christ as Savior. They haven't chosen to actually believe on him. They haven't chosen to, to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. They, they go through all the right motions. They have all the right actions. They say all the right words. They may dress all the right way. But they never actually believed on Jesus Christ. We've been up and down these the two the roads here in Fernwood, we've gone this way, we've gone the one crossroad in Fernwood, we've gone beyond that. But we found time and time again, people would say, oh yes, I used to go to that church. Years and years ago, where do you go now? Oh, I don't go to church now. I see, do you read your Bible? Occasionally. Do you pray? Occasionally. Are you sure you're going to heaven? Oh, definitely. Why? Because I got called forward and I came forward and I said a prayer when I was eight, seven, six, whatever. And I was told, all right, you're going to be a child of God. You're ready to go. But then I never came back to church again. Sad. It should be that desire to want to know Jesus Christ more. The Lord Jesus Christ wants you to take up your cross and follow him. People don't want to hear that. I Carry my cross? Follow Jesus Christ? I want to follow myself. And that's the problem. He wants you to keep his commandments because you love him. And you must read your Bible daily to know him better. You must pray to him daily to know him better. You must flock with fellow believers and worship Jesus Christ and hear his word preached and taught to know him better. He calls you to be a living sacrifice for him. He died for you so you can live for him. 
That's what he calls us for. To walk in holiness. To walk in the spirit. To walk with him. We're not guaranteed an easy life after salvation. It's just the opposite. Our easy life comes through death. Our easy life comes when we're in heaven. Close our eyes in death, wake up and see Jesus Christ. That's what we look forward to. That's where our hope is. It's not here on this earth. We can't hope in politicians. They'll fail us. We can't hope in other people. They'll fail us. Our hope is in Jesus Christ and him alone. All power belongs to Jesus Christ. And those men that came to arrest Jesus Christ thought that they were the ones in control. But any power that they had was because the Lord Jesus Christ allowed them to have that power. John 18, go down to verse 7. Then he asked them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And I just, I picture this scene in my head. You know, he speaks and says, I am. And all these men, we don't know how big a group it was, but they're carrying torches, they're carrying lanterns, they're carrying weapons. They all just fall down. Fall backward, fall down. They're all on the ground. Jesus is standing there. Meanwhile, behind him, his apostles are still waking up. What's going on? And then they stand up, and Jesus says to them, Who do you see? And they still say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, that's me. I am. He says, I am. Jesus then says to them, you know, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which ye spake. Of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. So even as he's being arrested, Jesus Christ is still the one in charge. The first time he said, I am he, the men fell backward and to the ground. The second time Jesus Christ said, I am he, they remained upright. Furthermore, he tells the men to allow his apostles to go their way, to not be arrested. And this fulfilled what Jesus Christ had prayed to the Lord God in John 17, verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd, and he does not lose any of his flock. Judas Iscariot was the son of perdition, one that had rejected Jesus Christ, a man of sin. As John wrote in John, 1 John chapter 2, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. And that's what we're going to see as we get closer and closer to the end times. People that, that seem to be of us, they're going to disappear. They're going to show that they weren't of us. And when the rapture happens, there's going to be a lot of surprised people. Sadly. Not surprised because all these, all these people disappeared. But people wonder, well, why didn't I disappear? Sad that day is going to be. Because the tribulation will then begin. And this world will not be a world where anybody will want to be on. And how sad because, again... These people are going to see the devastation that God is going to bring upon this world, that Jesus Christ is going to bring upon this world. And rather than repent and cry out and believe on Jesus Christ, those men are instead going to call on rocks to fall on them so that they could hide from Jesus Christ. When they could just call upon his name and they could be saved. Even though Judas Iscariot was an apostle that did not accord him anything special. And just as Paul spent the time in Romans chapters 2, 3, and 4, just because the Jews were Jews, 
did not mean anything special for them in terms of salvation. He still needed to believe on Jesus Christ and salvation through him alone. And Judas Iscariot not only rejected Jesus Christ, he rebelled and ended up betraying Jesus Christ. There's good news, because Jesus Christ is in control. He knew what Judas Iscariot was going to do. He knew what those soldiers were going to do. He knows what's going to happen next as he's taken to the house of Annas and Caiaphas and is brought to trial. He knows that they're going to mock him. They're going to slap him. They're going to say all kinds of vile things about him. He knows that he's going to be brought before Pontius Pilate. He knows that he's going to be scourged. He knows he's going to die or nailed to that cross and die for us. Nothing took him by surprise. And he was willing to do it still for us. What great love he has for us. And yet so many, they can't see it. They can't see it. We need to pray that God would open their eyes and realize they need Jesus Christ more than they need anyone or anything else. They need Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of all. And so for us, we look to him every day. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ. That name above all names. I thank you, Lord, that Jesus Christ is above all. And yet he lived among us, knew all things just as we did, but yet he never sinned once. And it still never sinned, it will never sin. And I thank you, God, that we can trust in him to be our savior and believe on him to have saved us from your wrath and from an eternity in hell. And Lord, I pray as we go through this week, we would be your ambassadors. We would be your ministers to others. And we would reflect that light from Jesus Christ upon all that we meet. And show them the love of Jesus Christ even when they're unlovable. And I thank you, God, that you equip us to be able to do that. That you give us the words to say. That you help us through each and every day when we humble ourselves and cast all our cares upon you. Lord, I pray that this day and every day Jesus Christ would be magnified. And these things I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.